Yes, why don't we start with you? I'm Gadi. I'm with the Neighborhood Service Center office in City Hall. <clears throat> I'm Eleanor Coleman. I'm with Catholic Family Center's Youth Build Program, and we're located over on Lincoln Ave. Khadija Mohammed. I am the new director of office and parent engagement for the Rochester City School District and also lines and four uh, John Lang, night before in schools committee. Becky Robinson, resident of the 19th Ward. Manuel Hernandez, uh, resident of the 19th Ward. Tammy Hahn, I'm a teacher at uh, School 44. Pat Connor, I work in branch administration for the Rochester Public Library. Fantastic. Elizabeth Miller, deputy superintendent of administration, is supposed to be here. Uh, she'll be talking about the training plans, and I don't know if you've got some input I'm put on. I have a guest um, to <laughs> Dr. Miller. And, oh, okay. Um, Dr. Golden. So. Okay, great. So, uh, since, well, let's see, how should we do this? Because I'd like to make sure that both uh, Elizabeth uh, Miller and uh, Daisy get to really be talking to one another um, because we really I had switched the two around here because uh, it might make sense to introduce what uh, the school is planning on doing as far as training goes before we get into what the neighborhood service centers are offering but um, just as we were talking about our need to have you here to talk about <laughs> what we're doing. <laughs> so, Cecilia Golden, and, and you're, you. what's your position I'm at the school? I'm um, Deputy Superintendent for Teaching and Learning. Okay. And Beth, you are? Hi, I'm Beth Massetti Miller, Deputy Superintendent for Administration and Partnerships. Great. And um, what we've been doing is trying to, um, for some time now, get the, um, the schools more involved with the communities because we've, we've had, for some time, um, you know, a lot of the teachers we talk to say they, they've been in the neighborhood, neighborhood school for umpteen years, but they never set foot in the neighborhood. And uh, so we're trying to, to change that and get the schools more involved with the community. Mm -hmm. And um, so in that respect, we've gotten a hold of Daisy, who has got some proposals from the Neighborhood Service Center as to what they could do and um, if you can pass that on and um, we also um, have invited uh, Dr. Miller here today to talk a bit about what the community mm -hmm. schools are going to be doing in terms of training because there's hey 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 Lee Who's the person from the neighborhood service center? Right here, Daisy. Over here. Over here. Yeah. Oh. Here. Okay. Does that mean on Genesee Street? Uh, she's all the neighborhood service City centers. Wide. Citywide. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my God. That's what I see. And Lee, if you'd introduce yourself to the group. I'm Lee Loomis. I lead a tutoring team at uh, <clears throat> number 10 school, Dr. Walter Cooper Academy. Uh, I lead it on behalf of the Rochester Engineering Society. And as of course most of you know, Dr. Walter Cooper Academy is temporarily housed at the Marshall campus up on Ridgeway. Okay, well, thank you very much. And if we can... Uh, I'm minus a tripod today, so I'm making do. 
and ran out of the house. With only half the junk in my pocket I usually run out with. So, um, since you're he here and we want to make sure we don't keep people longer than necessary, uh, Beth, could you go over for us what the planned training is for these schools that are required to go into community school mode? We've been watching what's been going on at 17 and for the past several years and we know what a monumental effort has been put into that mm -hmm. and uh, I'm watching these four schools that we're involved with here mm -hmm. kind of say oh we'll be able to check this off when we make mm -hmm. the transition and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what all is going to be going on to help them do that yeah yeah so I'm not sure I'm just going to angle myself I can't quite see everybody there so um First of all, uh, I do have the, op the Office of Community Schools within um, our department, if you will, our side of the house. Um, and we currently have 10 community schools, and I'm not sure if you're all aware of that. Um, we hear often about 17, but there are 10 of them. Um, and they all are at different points in their development and they uh, each community school kind of has its own personality if you will and that's what they're designed for is they're supposed to be unique to meet the needs of that school community and the community in which they live as well um, so I did bring a couple little things it is there is information on the website um, I'll get to that after but I thought do people know about community schools do you feel aware of what they are I, I only know that through, through this committee, okay. but I don't really know a lot okay. about and, and a lot of people don't. So, so I thought I'd do a little bit about the ABCs of community schools really briefly, and then talk about um, each, a little bit about our current schools, but also about the schools that we're adding on. So just to give you context, because it is a journey, I guess I'm going to stand up. The, bot, the point is about community schools is they are individual, but there are certain, con I have to move for a minute. Oh, that's okay. Okay. There are certain concepts that remain true about what a community school is and why we have them, okay? So in terms of this first try, I know it's small, but I can send it to you, I can do however, this is for your information, is there are, it's a triangle about how do you improve a school? So the community school model is part of school improvement. It doesn't mean that every school's in receivership or in the worst state to become a community school. High-performing schools can be community schools. But it's all around strengthening what you're doing inside the schoolhouse so that kids continue to thrive and be as successful as possible. So there are kind of this triangle about a solid core instructional model, um, expanded learning opportunities. So when you take these three pieces of the triangle, it's creating a community, a school that's strong for kids. And comprehensive support services. So strong instructional core, expanded learning opportunities to enrich or support students, and then co comprehensive support services that buoy the system at the same time. And then you can see in the middle how it's the child, the family, and the community, how they all make those connections, all right? So when you look at a community school, it's those three pieces that you're looking at to strengthen what's going on inside the schoolhouse. So there are elements of community schools, but it doesn't mean that every community school has the same elements. Because it may be this community doesn't need that, but they need this. But there are some things that are common, right? So if you go down here, we talked about the strong curriculum and instruction, and talking about community and parent engagement and collaborative leadership, essential which I think is some, one of the things we're gonna talk about today. Health and mental health services are available to, ch to children and ultimately their families if needed it about health services. 
um, a positive school climate and youth development opportunities, um, expanded learning that I spoke about, social services, human and social services support as needed, and adult education and workforce. So the notion is that when you go to a community school, if you're building the community and the families and their needs, um, that it would include these elements. Workforce development. That would be something that ultimately a community school would do because if you have the community working tightly, that you're creating jobs for the people in your community or access to them. That's why we'll talk about neighborhood associations that are so critical. Um, health services, I do want to talk about that. Some of our schools have health clinics. Not every school has a health clinic, um, but many of our current schools, some of our schools do, and we do have um, those services at some of our community schools. Um, the positive school climate is a must, um, but that comes with youth development, so it can be from kindergarten through 12th grade because we have community schools that are in our high schools as well um, and then the, the collaborative leadership and um, engagement and that is not only about authentically engaging the families within the school but the community at large that gets involved as well so I'm going to go back up a little bit or move forward I should say and talk about School 17. How many people are familiar with School 17? A lot of school. Okay. The the strength with School 17 is that they have a very strong community that has really pushed the initiative, if you will, in that neighborhood, the Jasana neighborhood, and they have Charles Settlement House there. So they that community sees the school as the hub of that neighborhood. So that is part of what is working at School 17. It's not perfect, but you get, all, you get the community co-leading what's going on in that community. The school principal is the leader of the community school, there is no question, but they are working in tandem all the time with the community and depending on the strength of the community helps, helps build the community school effort. I do want to point out that another school, which is school number nine, school number nine is a very strong community school. And they would say they've been a community school a really long time without us calling it a community mm -hmm. school. They have Baden Street there, they're very connected to that community. They have a health center. They have expanded learning programs that are going on. They have the, the faith-based community very involved there. They are a community school, but people don't talk as much about Nine. But Nine is a very strong community school. And what, what street is that on? Clinton. It's on North Clinton, isn't it? Yeah. Near, near what? Um, it. Coca-Cola. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> It's got the McDonald's, you, you come over to, um, ha, yeah, you know where the Coca-Cola plant is? Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay, so right there. So they have a health center in that building. Baden Street is right behind them. Because, yeah, I know where Baden Street is. So they have Baden Street, they have the health center, they have the faith-based community, they have the churches in that area. And that, Baden Street and number nine have had a, um, a connection for many, many years. And they have a rec center. That's the other piece, and I know Daisy can speak a little bit to that. Um, also, 17 has a rec center connected to their school. A rec center. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's where the city of Rochester is so important in this whole um, effort about making things work. So let me back up to 17 for a minute. They have the rec center. They have a house center. I'll come back to that. They have Charles <coughs> Settlement House. They ha so they have a lot of people already in that hub totally saying, I'm gonna put my arms around the school, right? That's what makes 17 unique and unique. I'll just stop right there. But um, Health Center is a little deceiving because 
a school can be a community school without a health center, no question. Not every health center just serves the kids in that building. As a matter of fact, 17 doesn't serve necessarily the kids in that building unless their primary care is via that health center. Mm. So who do they serve? They serve, they can, it, people that get their health care through, it's not regional health, but I, f I forget which health um, organization is in there. And that's something we're working on, where number nine school serves the kids in their school. So every school has something a little bit different. So um, in our plan, let me just go through this last piece if I need to touch on it. So. Um, in the Rochester City School District, again, we look at the triangle, we look at those elements and what should be working for schools, and then we have some strategies that we're saying are important to the Rochester City School District. That we have a site coordinator in, uh, in every school, Come, back, I'll, I'll go through details more, that there's professional learning networks for principals and site coordinators, um, that we have space that... Um, space and time to establish uh, relationships in the community, that we have expanded learning opportunities, and that we have infrastructure to support a director and we created an office of community schools. So that being said, we have 10. What happened is those 10 are still working. We're building them. Some of them are only a year and a half old. So that's why there's different levels of um, implementation, I guess is the best way to put it. So we got 10 new receivership schools, unfortunately, um, but that's okay, we're gonna work with them to build them back up. People often connect receivership with community schools, schools that are really in just a lot of trouble, right? They're just not making it. What's true is using the community school model is one strategy that the state accepts from us as a plan to move forward to save the schools okay so yes we are introducing 10 schools into being community schools some of which are in the 19th ward and, and what makes them in receivership based on their academic performance their variety of things mostly it's their academic performance graduation rate, but they also look at absenteeism, suspension rates. There's a variety of things, there's a formula, quite unfortunately, that gets you there. Then on top of that, they rank you in the state. Okay, so they look at how are the kids doing? What's the graduation rate? Are they coming to school? Is the school creating a safe environment? They put a formula to it, they make a list, and if you're in the bottom 5% of the state, it's embarrassing to say, that puts you into receivership. They rank each individual school? Every school across the state. And that's the website for? Because then you can look at and they'll be different. And then you can search on receivership and that will take you to the report It's so, the bottom line is, it's schools that aren't doing well, and unfortunately, we're at the bottom of the state. Now, there are other receivership schools in the state. Mm -hmm. I think there's 80, 74, or something like that. It's just that we have 10 in them. We, we have 10 of them? We have 10 of them. We have in Rochester. In Rochester. In Rochester City School City. District. Now, we had schools come out. Mm -hmm. We were very successful. Schools came out. Right? Where were you? 44. 44. So we had schools come out, but unfortunately at the same time oh, that cycle okay. ended, now they brought in another cycle. And that's what we're working on now with the new schools and creating new community schools. Does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. well, Good. Yep. They failed okay. the test. But basically. Mm -hmm. basic. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't some good things going on in those schools. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say that too. But they are not doing what they need to do. And that's, we have to 
we're, we're, we have to be really intentional about what we're doing to help these schools turn around. But there can also be growth in those schools, but it's just not enough. Not enough. What correct, mm -hmm. correct, so mm -hmm. correct. So they can make growth. So now I'm, I'm receivership now, and I have different measures that, that will tell us whether or not we're not going to be receivership anymore, for lack of a better way to put it, right? And I have, to, as a school, then I try to show my growth along the way. And that's what the state starts to look for. That's for receivership. Community schools is one of the strategies we're using to improve our schools. Make sense? To get them out of receivership. Yeah. To make it better, yes. If, if they are. <laughs> but you know what? Here's the thing. It's still good to have some community schools because they're great for, if they're working, can help any school be better. But don't, he, don't parents confuse like receivership with being, a, what do you call it, a community school? Um, no, they don't. I don't know about that. I don't know the answer Not to that. Not every school that's in receivership becomes a community school. Mm -hmm. So like when 44 went into receivership, we did not become a community school. We did other things to help bring us out. So just because you're in receivership doesn't mean you automatically become a community school. Is that a bad thing to be a community no, school? I no, think it's a really that's good a good thing. thing. So let me just like, say, I would like to see more, in my personal opinion. So part of our strategic plan with the district over a year ago, when we opened up the office for community schools, still seeking a director, we had one, is that our plan was to, if we had to touch a school, if you will, impact a school, they would become a community school. Now, the, the burden, not burden, but the challenge for us is how do we now build these new schools up, okay? Some have health centers, some have rec centers, some already have expanded day, right? Now we have to help them figure this out and that's what we're in the process of doing and we're only at the early stages. Yes? How long does um, a school have to um, improve those metrics that put them into receiving? Well, our first year of um, weighing in from the state will be June of 20. Year? So, what year? They considered, well, and I'm not going to be a naysayer, but they said this was our first year even though we only were identified officially in February. But they said this year, the one we just finished, was year one. And they said they wouldn't hold us accountable for year one but year two, you're on the cycle. So you have to jump, you have to, you have to make immediate impact, let me put it that way. It's a challenge. So you essentially have a year from the time you're lab labeled as a uh, receivership school? So well, 18 months. 18 they, months. They say we have, well, in February, yeah. It's not very long. Not even, yeah, about 18 months. That was different from in the past. It used to be, it was the three year cycle. You could come, yeah, schools come out, then you have not, then when they, re, then we went through the next cycle, then we got the next whole group out, except for two, which were the high schools. Well, so are, are you giving, are the schools giving more, more teachers, more aides? That's a really good question. Um, I'm here, I'm, I'm talking about all the problems, but at the same time, we, I have created a community of these schools that is coming together weekly to build on their training. They get um, advanced um, opportunity to do their hiring. Um, they have election to work agreements where teachers have to sign on and say, I'll work at the school, but you have to understand you have to do these things with us. But at the same time, the state did not give us any extra money. Oh, that's not good. So you're able no. to provide more services with less resources? You know, same or amount of resources? better mm -hmm. services. I mean, everything should be better, right? It should be not more of the same, but really, really, really rethinking about what you're doing. You can't do more of the same and think it's going to get better and better and better. It's really about reflecting, looking at that core of the program, which is what 
Dr. Golden is working on with us to make the instructional, better, instructional program better. But at the same time, we are moving forward with the community school work. And that's where we need the community. So that's where we have agencies come in and say, if you're getting funding for working with mental health services, making that up, right? Come and do it in our school. You're with our community. We have the same goals, right? So that's the collective impact that we're looking for in a community school. Sure. Does that make sense? Yes. So okay. let, me, let me just add, say this too. Beth, I think you're really answering all these questions really great. But for an example, um, health services in a school is, are expected to help with attendance. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a toothache, you're not going to come to school. And if you do, you can't pay attention. You're not going to be able to focus. Mm -hmm. So having the health services in the school um, are intended to improve attendance and therefore improve learning. Expanded learning opportunities is a longer school day, right? Expected for students to have more time on task, which will then improve their academic achievement. Um, so just every kind of support is to lead to that um, um, same end point, improved academic, social, and emotional health for our kids. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to just add that piece because um, Beth has said over and over again, um, it's a strategy. It's a strategy to make improvements in the identified areas for which that school has found itself placed on that um, list. Right. So you should be able to map the activity to the metric that you're trying to do. Map the strategy to the metric. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 why. Which so, is so going to so be a good. You, oh, please. So then you can allocate specific services yes. that are more needed in certain places. Right. Appropriately. Right, and and also <laughs> making sure we do appropriate root cause analysis. Right? right. You know, don't assume that John is not coming to school for X, but find out why, and then if it's a child care issue, because. Children have to stay home to take care for, of their younger children. We need um, Daisy's help, others' help, how to get child care for that family. So it's all about the community coming together to improve the outcomes for our, our children. Okay? I think that um, one of the things when um, Cecilia mentioned about um, the coordination of the services and doing a needs assessment or root cause analysis for each student and for the community. There is to be a site coordinator. They call them community school site coordinator at every school to do that work with the school, with the community. Because we've had, they'll say, well, this school has services. What we found is many times, A, there's not a needs assessment done and we just bring in services and we don't know if it's meeting the family's needs or that will meet the kids' needs. Um, so this and the time and effort it takes. So you want the principal to stay focused on the instructional program, right? But all of this, all of this other critical work should be done. They can't do it all, right? So we have site coordinators that we're working to get. They're at our current schools but that will be one of the first steps in these new schools. So then we can do that needs assessment and begin building what that school needs with the community. Now, right, right now, the 10 receivership schools, these are 10 new ones that are, that are gonna become community schools. Yes. And you, that's on top of 17 or 17? On top of 17. On 17 and nine? Or and on top of nine. Okay. so. And so if you do go to our district website, it does tell you the schools that are community schools, and then we'll be adding these new schools. We're going to be working on getting the site coordinator, for example. So is a site coordinator um, a teacher? Um, it's an administrator. An administrator. In this role, it is an administrator, yes. And they have a degree? They have a, yes, they have to have a degree, and they have to have 
a school district building level degree to do this role. Now I will say, not to confuse things more, but in some schools, again, when you're developing a community school and you're looking at the whole school and what they need, what is the capacity of the school, how much does the principal have to take on, what may, are they, have they been there a while? Is it a newer principal? We have principals that are all different levels coming into our receivership schools. Is that you can also have a lead agency. You can also have a contract with an agency to come work with you to do that role as well. And that's something we work out at the building level. So sometimes it's a district level administrator and sometimes it's an agency that's coming in and helping the school do that. So, for example, Center for Youth is one of our agencies that does that Center work. Center for Youth. Center for Youth, yeah. So we aren't there yet with our new schools to establish that because also we're working with the community to say, do, you have enough co do we have enough in the community to help us get these 10 off the ground, right? So it's a lesson for the community as well because we need to come together to have this work. Um, and there, there is a citywide community effort to do that, which I'll talk about as we get towards the end okay. about our summit. Yeah, one of the things that, um, that we've been trying to do, Southwest Common Council mm -hmm. and, and this, this committee, mm -hmm. this education committee, is to try to see what other resources do we have we could pull in, and that's why I asked Daisy to come here. Mm -hmm. We talked with her about what might the neighborhood service centers be able to do for, you know, in conjunction with yeah. the schools, and maybe this would be a good point where Daisy can give us a little feel for what we had talked about. Sure. So, <clears throat> I don't know how many of you know what the service centers do, offer, locate it. They do everything. <laughs> so we used to be called the Net Office, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, the Net Office has been around since the Johnson administration, right. and uh, I believe in 2009 we changed the name under the Duffy administration, and that became, that uh, was as a result of three departments merging. So we became the Neighborhood Service Centers, and we have stayed with that name since. The Neighborhood Service Center basically is a, a way to bring together the community and have you have a physical location to go to so that you can walk in and talk about things like um, there's, a pro there's a property in my neighborhood that is just looking not too good. Mm -hmm. it's, it has broken windows, um, the roof is looking really bad, it has peeling paint. And there's people living in it, and I'm just wondering if you know that's something that is under mm -hmm. your radar for code mm -hmm. violation. So we obviously our staff pulls up the information and can address it on the phone, and then deploy proper staffing that's from the code enforcement office to go look at it. That is the one activity that we're most known for: code enforcement and um, responding to the complaint calls. But the other piece of the service mm -hmm. center, actually, I think, just, I think is a fun piece, um, is the opportunity that we have to connect with groups like this. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when I met um, John and I met Katarina and I went over to the school, I knew about the school because I have a daughter who's a teacher and I had been there when she was student teaching and I got to hear some really nice things about the school. So in this role, uh, the mayor had asked me to connect with Katarina and I went over there and... I was just really amazed at the, the ambiance, the feeling when I walked in that school. Uh, the kids, everybody looked happy, and it's like, wow, this is, this is quite the school. Um, and she invited me to go 17. So I went back and I started to attend a couple of the parent meetings that are there on Fridays, I think at like at 9 o'clock. And um, it's basically, it's not even, I don't know what to call it, it's a group of gathering of parents who just sit there and talk and find out the latest thing, and Katarina stops in and she says hello. Um, she, in some cases, even though it's their birthday, it's just, it's really a community mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of people. And uh, I said, you know, one thing that I think we could do here, and I was talking to John is, um, I remember um, when I moved into a new neighborhood, I would be welcomed by either some neighborhood group, an association, 
some of them used to be called welcome wagons and they would drop off some kind of a goodie bag at your door and you find out, oh, so there's a dentist office here and there's a mm -hmm. pediatrician over here. And I thought, why can't we do that from the neighborhood service centers for our teachers? Mm -hmm. um, knowing that, you know, again, having a daughter who's a teacher and picking her brain, she says, mom, you go into the school, you open the door, you teach, you know the children, you go home. Mm -hmm. I says, and so what's the neighborhood connection? She goes, well, some teachers do go out, some don't, some live in the neighborhood, some don't, mm -hmm. so it depends. I said, so what happens if a child arrives in the classroom and they're crying because they're gonna lose their friends because they have to move? Mm -hmm. And then you talk to the child as a teacher, you say, why do you have to move? You go, we well, don't know. Did your mom buy a house? Did your dad buy a house? No. So why are you moving? So that begins to give you a telltale. And maybe there's an eviction going on in here that we should know about. So if you have something where you find out by talking to a child that there's an eviction going on, and then you talk to your principal or someone in the school and say, I don't know what to do here. This child can't focus. They're just really worried that they're going to you know, move in and miss their friends. This is the opportunity for you to call us, and you can find out that you, that you know their address, and you can find out, hey, I need to know if this child is moving because of an eviction, there's a code violation going on, and they have to move because we do issue vacate orders. When any property in the city of Rochester that houses children is impacted by an eviction or a court order to vacate the property for health and hazards, the impact really is on the child. Mm -hmm. There's children there, and that's some of the trauma that the mayor talks about, our children see a lot of trauma in the community. Sometimes it's trauma on their way to school, sometimes it's trauma in their own lives. So how do we help the ones that are caring for these children, in this case teachers, to know about resources? So I said, why don't we put together, we just ordered these. Mm -hmm. These are neighborhood service center bags and hold a reception for the teachers on maybe Superintendent's Day or maybe mm -hmm. on the first day back to school and say, welcome back. We wanted to put in here information about who we are, information about other resources in the community, and put an apple in here and some kind of a gift card to welcome them into the neighborhood, let them know this is happening in your neighborhood, and if one of the children in the classroom wants to know about the rec center, here it is. I think we have one of the best rec center systems in the country, mm -hmm. and we have a lot of resources for children in rec centers. We have, I think, really yeah. one of the best. Yeah. So I like to put in here rec center information, Obviously, this is our brochure, this is my team, and the person that is assigned to this area is Mr. James Demps. He's your administrator for this area, and his assistant is John McMahon. I also brought with me, literally hot off the press, the celebration of commercial quarters. This is published by my office annually at the middle of the year because we follow a June to July fiscal year. Okay. What you're gonna see in here is highlights from the commercial districts, and you're gonna see Genesee Street in here, Charlie Avenue, Jefferson, West Main Street, and South Plymouth. <coughs> These are commercial districts in your area, and we highlight the wonderful businesses that are in your neighborhood. They, the presidents of the business association send this information to me. We put it all together. We have what's called the Magic Department duplication, and we get these out. Sometimes teachers would like to get out, maybe go out to get some a bite to eat. Mm -hmm. This one here, some of the restaurants that we have in your area. So we'll put one of these in there too. I'll also put our year-end report for the NSC centers, and then I'll put in my business cards, but we really want to highlight James, who's in this neighborhood. Sure. He knows, I can ask James, hey, where's Arnett in this? He'll tell me, blank, 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 because he walks the neighborhood. He's keeping an eye on the quality of life, and that's our lens is the quality of life. But I also want to make sure that you understand we are your partners. I can't do this without you. I hope that you will consider when we put together a group to start we want to stuff as many bags as we have to, so I'm going to rely on John to tell me how many bags we're going to bring over to, uh, in this case, School 19, so yeah, that we can 19. welcome the teachers and awesome. let them know that. It's 16, you know, and you know, yeah. we got four of them in the neighborhood here. So you'll let me know. <coughs> okay. In here, we're also going to put a keychain. I'm going to try to see if I can find some nice mugs for them or some kind of a drinking cup. And just to let them know that we welcome you into this neighborhood and there's a wonderful resource that you can use. Um, and we hope that it's not just welcome back in September that we can maybe do something at Christmas time, the holidays, and then do something at the end of the year to celebrate the accomplishments. I think that's a way and I hope that we can start building community and yeah. letting the teachers know that they're not here alone, mm -hmm. that there are resources. They might live wherever they live, mm -hmm. but this community while they're here six, seven hours a day, we wanna be supportive of them. I, 
is now the appropriate time to ask a couple Absolutely. questions. Uh, again, I'm Lee Loomis, and I lead a tutoring team at Number 10 School, <coughs> yes. which has currently students that are being bussed in to Number 10 yes. from all over the city. Um, and of course, Number 10 has recently been put in receivership. Mm -hmm. One of the things that can drive you into receivership is absenteeism. Yes. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it's my understanding that a significant number of the students at Number 10 School are um, basically homeless mm -hmm. and move to two or three different shelters during the school year. And that there's a problem inherent with that because it takes the city school system a week or two to catch up with where they're supposed to pick you up to take you to school. And so that be a week to 10 days that a child would not be coming to school because there wasn't transportation. And that's not really the fault or responsibility of the school itself. Nevertheless, it places them in receivership mm -hmm. and there really isn't anything they can do in their list of how do we fix everything so, to do that. My, my point and my question here is, are the uh, neighborhood centers, service centers, familiar with, acquainted with the homeless shelters mm -hmm. so that in these particular families who are in considerable distress under those circumstances can feel supported? Um, they do the best they can sure. at number 10 school and they have even on occasion interceded with the city school district transportation department mm -hmm. to try and hurry up and get a kid located identified and picked up so they can come to school um, is there some coordination some synergy here so between the neighborhood centers and the homeless shelters to well not directly however when we issue a vacate order, we issue it, the city. So we can begin a practice and maybe even a policy, because my department issues and we create policy, a policy that if you, the service center staff, is aware that we just vacate, many of you may be aware of it, known <coughs> as the Hungerford Building, mm -hmm. back on Dewey Avenue and then on Thurston Road, where the, the property owner was just not there, would not respond to our calls, would not pick up the phone, the local or the New York City sure. people. And um, unfortunately, there was no heat and it was like, I don't know, five below when it hit. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we had to go in and vacate. So <clears throat> one of the things that um, our staff is aware of and the inspectors who talk about seeing trauma, our inspectors see a lot of trauma. Our inspectors go in and say, you have until midnight to remove all your belongings or take what you need we're going to shut this building down because there's no heat. Our inspectors, um, and I know some of this a little more in detail because my son is a supervisor for city inspectors. So he walks around with this card that has a list of shelters and he calls the shelters himself to place a family. We can do that. And then in the morning, they can come and tell the NSC office, listen, last night we relocated three families of, uh, of, of order to vacate and they're sitting at the Salvation Army. So now I know the family, the size of the family, and what kind of help do they need. So immediately we can deploy our resources to work with whatever shelter it is. So that's my, f that is one of the ways where I get information like right off immediately. Mm -hmm. We also belong to our housing department, Carol Wheeler, who's a director of housing. We belong to what's called the Continuum Consortium Care, CCC. This is a consortium that was created many, many years ago. When I used to work, I ran the YWCA housing shelter for women. And at that time that was created. And this is a consortium of shelter providers that talk to each other and have a network. And they can tell each other, listen, we just got a family, we need to figure out how to get them bust and blah, blah, blah. So the thing, what I'm trying to say is that we have a couple of entry points where we can touch these families almost quickly so that they don't miss the two weeks that you're talking about yeah. in trying to get to school and sitting in a shelter. Right. Now, I'm on the board of the Salvation Army and we run shelters. So one of the things that I can start exploring is, what is there, is there a organized process where the Army gets families with children and what happens when we have to make sure they get to school? Does the Army use the Army van? Because we have a van. 
and get them to school until the city school district finds the house, you know, the uh, transportation. So you've actually brought up a good point that's going to make me go back and now Well, ask. and one particular case that I'm aware of that we had to deal with at number 10 school this past year was a family who had stayed their limit at a shelter mm -hmm. and had to be relocated to another one because you can only stay here two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, whatever. And so this particular child that they intervened on had been, you know, moved and lived in three different shelters during the school year. And so, and I, I don't know, I mean, God keeps track of these people because God can do everything. I don't know that the city or the school district has the facilities to do that kind of thing, but the end result is a kid misses 30, 40 yeah. days of school, oh, and what do they do? The state education department banks the school, mm -hmm. which to me doesn't make any sense, but it's... You, know. you raise a really good point, and you know, I'm going to ask the administrators you know, what's been their experience, but I'm also going to ask our shelter director of the Salvation Army because I know they belong to the consortium care and find out is there a organized slash process to yeah. identify these families to expedite their transportation needs. I and mean, even if it's just calling the district, I mean, just, listen, I had a family land here last night. They need busing. How do we get them to you? Because oh, um, cause I had a couple of questions, but I know with that, because I've had many, 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 many children who have been homeless. And I know that the city school district does have like a whole department where mm -hmm. they do a lot yeah. of services and help because I've been in the city for 20 years and I, I whenever I've had a child with housing issues and that, um, I've always gone to my social worker. Yeah. I never was aware, to be honest, that, um, that that you guys could also help. So I know you're saying that you will put the orders out and you say there are resources, but I'm just wondering what those resources are. Because I, I, I honestly don't know if my social workers are even aware. You know, they, ha they know a lot of community um, agencies out there that help, but I don't know if they're aware that this is also an I agency that can help. We don't get a lot of calls from social workers. I think um, one of the things I need to do is maybe do a little bit of back a step and sit down with people that run the 211 number they deploy a lot of resource information and also sit down with the city's own 311. <coughs> we manage the 311 system for the whole city. Uh, you cannot get 311 outside of the city borderline. I literally tried it one day. I was on the border of a town. I said, let me call 311. It didn't work. I said, man, they're, they're really for real. <laughs> I can't call. <laughs> I, somehow the technology doesn't work, but I crossed the street and it worked. So 311 is for the city, mm -hmm. and we can have our city staff also. They have a resource doc. It's all online, and if someone calls, hey, you know, I just lost my housing tonight. Um, I have two children. Where can I go? And let me just say, we are still um, not fully, we don't have full capacity to take care of families that are homeless. Uh, when I ran the shelter for the YWCA, if I got a mom with children, I'm going to be honest with you, I sneak them in mm -hmm. because I was not supposed to have children age 12, 13. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I cannot tell a mom that her 12-year-old son cannot come in here. Like, I couldn't do it, so, so I'll get fired. Thankfully, we had a very compassionate, and they still do, executive director at the YWCA who said, I didn't see it. <laughs> <laughs> and the child was stay there with mom, at least for that overnight. I, and so mm -hmm. there are some policies in place that um, I, I think they're not conducive for families. But I think we've gotten better as a community. But I do know at the Salvation Army, we had to actually build a special mm -hmm. wing on West Avenue mm -hmm. uh, where they had to have moms and children. Um, I have some kids there. Yeah. So, but I mean, I also have children who have had housing issues that aren't necessarily homeless. Yeah, yeah, no. Um, let, and like when paint. I have, but like even like, what? Um, well, there's, I'm trying to think there's like a lot, there's, there's been one, I, I had one family who was a squatter and the mold and all of that, so we had to really work with that family and the social worker did a lot and we did a lot to try to help find housing for that family. Um, I've had where 
um, a family was renting and they woke up in the middle of the night and the roof caved in and you know it was like, there and that, I've been a, there's been a lot but we've never I've never personally known that this was an opportunity so I'm just wondering like um, not just homeless but other ones like I've had where you know children talk about um, different pests that yes, their house yes, is no. invested in or that you know they're renting and it's really not Sorry. in Actually, good condition or warm describe, enough for them. What you're describing is our meat and potatoes. That's really the gist of what we do. So if a child is in the classroom and says, or you notice bed bugs, Mm -hmm. oh, that's a big one. Mm -hmm. There's a big one. That's the one here. And we actually had somebody come in and left bed bugs in our office. Yeah. Bed bugs. Immediately, you could call our office and tell us this child lives at this place. I want the mother or the father, whoever's taking care of this child, to connect with you. We don't want to blow in a family because families don't want to be homeless. I get it. Mm -hmm. But is it a punitive thing? Because I, I don't want to. We try not to be punitive because okay. we're going to go after the landlord and okay. we're not going after the family. Okay. Landlords have a responsibility in this community to be good landlords. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go after the property owner, manager, or landlord, and we're going to say, we have identified an issue in your property. Mm -hmm. So if it's an interior issue and you call our office, we're going to call the inspector. We have 40-something um, inspectors deployed to that particular property. If it's an exterior issue, we will cite it on site because we could see with our own eyes. Mm -hmm. To go inside a property, I need permission from the property or the landlord own or the um, tenant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the tenant calls our office and says, hey, I'm just noticing some things in the apartment, this doesn't look healthy, and we'll say, have you told the landlord? Yes. Have they responded? No. Can we come in? Yes, we're going in. Because now they've taken their responsibility as a tenant and exercise it. Mm -hmm. And now the landlord hasn't responded, so now we're going to come in <coughs> and start citing. If it's a health issue, we could order a vacate, but we're really careful. I mean, we have a commissioner who, he's just really, it, it hurts all of us when we hear we vacated a house and we see, you know, the boxes of diapers being mm -hmm. rolled out because mm -hmm. we know that that was a child's home. Mm -hmm. And we try our best to work with landlords. We try not to be punitive. We just re redesign a, um, I should have brought the reports, a redesign what we call the nuisance abatement point system. It's called NAPS, and this is a point system that we put on a property for uh, violations. I'll give you an example. A property um, um, has a, uh, someone has an altercation, they're fighting, someone pulls a gun out, no one's hurt, but they pull a gun out and they push, you know, fires were shot, the police is called. It's a landlord with a two-family house, and um, we call the landlord and say, we're going to put 10 points on your property. Mm -hmm. However, these points are being uh, pending. They haven't been assessed. So you have 10 days to come in and talk to us and abate the situation. Maybe you have a tenant that you should not have there anymore because you're causing this havoc to other tenants. So they come in, and we put together a plan. It's called an abatement plan. That abatement plan has to be followed. If you don't get into any more trouble for the next six months, the points go away. That means that you've been sitting down with James Demps at least once a month for six months to make sure that abatement plan is being worked on, that you got a good lease document, you just didn't take cash, that you understand that they have a job, and they don't have a job if they have a service, that you find out, are they gonna be home all day, they're not gonna be home all day, they're gonna be working. That's a good abatement plan. And then at the end of six months, we go back and say, you know what, you did everything you're supposed to do, we haven't had any more trouble in the property, points go away, we're good. If the landlord does not respond and another fight happens, now you're up to 20 points. You have just reached threshold, and at that point, we bring you in to the city law department to find out why have you not abated this problem. Your, your neighbors are tired. They don't want to hear any more gunfire in the middle of the night, the fighting, the late parties. So they say, well, you know, I can't control them. Well, then guess what? You shouldn't be a landlord. Mm -hmm. And we have had in the law department, and it's not a good day, but properties that are saying, okay, we're shutting you down. So um, as I listen to you, I think I'm thinking about what is the direct line 
between NSC say, um, I have a couple of questions. On average, how many um, homes or, or um, houses are vacated a month? I don't know, you know? And how many children are impacted? And, and then whether or not there is a direct line between NSC, RCSD that says, you know, this, the, the Gonzalez family was vacated last night. There are six uh, school-aged children. They need transportation, it, you know. Um, and then what is our response to be able to say, you know, um, to kids, don't worry, the kid that comes to school crying, we'll have you in school within either 24 hours or 48 hours. I wonder whether or not we need to look at those two systems, how we communicate and our, our uh, ability to respond. So it may not be a school bus, but certainly there's all different kinds of, mm -hmm. of relationships mm -hmm. we have with transportation to make that happen. So I, I just think we need to look at that. Mm -hmm. And while I have the floor, <laughs> I wanted to reintroduce Khadija Muhammad, who is, who is the new um, director for parent community and parent engagement with the school district. And I'm thinking, would that not be a good place to call to say, you have, we have these number of students that need transportation because they were, you know, removed from their housing last night. Mm -hmm. And she can then make the calls to make sure, and mm -hmm. we have something that says mm -hmm. best, you know, we, we do mm -hmm. get kids to school within this amount of time. Mm -hmm. Not no week, not a week, not whatever, but either it's either gonna be 24 hours mm -hmm. or 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Right? Now you raise, uh, Dr. Gold, you raise a really good point. And that's something that, you know, in this position, when you hear stories like that, you begin to think, how do we connect the dots mm -hmm. so that we talk to each other? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think Ms. Muhammad's office is really the office that we can start with mm -hmm. because it's parent engagement. And mm -hmm. you're, you're yeah. touching who we would need to talk to. Mm -hmm. But the other piece is, I can, you know, have a meeting with my staff and look at, when inspectors, we have a system called the BIS system, and my secretary, who has been with the city like 15 years, it, it's a very antiquated system. I refuse to learn it because it reminds me of microfiche. It's like, oh my <laughs> God, you guys. Oh my so we're in the process. Uh, we just uh, were awarded a grant through uh, the Attorney General's office to um, improve our uh, land management system. That's what that is. Mm -hmm. So we hope, we hope, we have our fingers crossed, and in about a year we're going to, you know, just revamp the whole system. But that system, if you know how to use it and read it, it really tells us a lot. Because in the mornings when we come in, we can say, okay, let's look for this code, which is the code of vacates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We say, okay, oh, no vacates last night, wonderful, we're good to go. Um, we can begin, I would love to continue this conversation offline mm -hmm. and sit down with the city school district and look at how do we work so that we communicate to each other. And I think the other person I need to bring here is my manager at 311. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. they get the calls, hey, I just lost my apartment, where can I go? They'll pull up the 211 information, mm -hmm. which is fine. But I know that there are pieces of information that make the puzzle you know, just right. But the other pieces, I also think that, I don't know if um, Ms. Muhammad's office is in contact with our faith community. But I also think many people call their faith leaders mm -hmm. when this happens. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should, I know the mayor's office, actually last night we just did a clergy on patrol on no, Monday night. And we have, I believe, a faith leader in every quad that we, is our go-to person. Oh. So I need to talk to Tracy Miller, who's the mayor's uh, assistant, to find out maybe we need to have a conversation with the naturals that people go to when they are in, you know, despair. And that would be, you know, one of them being homeless. So I think, you know, I, I'm so glad that John invited me because I wanted to really start this conversation. When, you know, I, we were recently at Harvard, um, we went there to um, work with the folks that are helping us write this grant for um, the land management system. and. We went, I went with the mayor and I went with um, our, dir our director of business and uh, of housing mm -hmm. and we had to do a presentation to the, there were 10 mayors from all New York State mm -hmm. and it was our turn to do a presentation and make a case for uh, the grant that we were about to embark on and write. And we had to 
um, make the case of how systems don't talk to each other mm -hmm. and result in trauma. And the case that we used was Tyshawn Caldwell. Mm -hmm. That's exactly the case that we used. And the mayor got up and she said to everyone, you know, please close your eyes. Mm -hmm. um, I want you to think about a hot summer night in July. It's sweating bullets in your apartment. The windows don't open because they're just stuck. Um, the mother has called because there's people loitering in the front, drug dealers, and her babies can't go outside to play. So they're stuck inside the house and they keep begging mom, can we go out, can we go out, get some fresh air? It's 10 o'clock at night. Finally, she feels you know, for them and she says, okay, you can go out. So she lets them go out. And the next thing you know, her baby is killed by crossfire that was not aimed at him, but he's killed. Mm -hmm. And all of that is because the mother had called different systems about the code, about the property, RP, you know, the police, and different, and the landlord, and people had heard, but no one was doing this to each other. Mm -hmm. So um, at the end of the presentation, well, grown men were about to cry. Mm. But the, the, the thing was to show a picture of what happens when systems don't talk to each other. So now we're actually looking at writing the grant and using a stairway uh, instead of a silo, a stairway of services so that when you climb a stairway, you have a goal, you're going somewhere mm -hmm. so that we can finally, you know, all these things lead to a resolution. So I think this is what we need to do and get together. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm reading my brochures. Um, I um, will give this to you, John. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the big ones. Um, the big ones. Um, okay. Um, we're doing beats at Brooks. And I will be there. Uh, the one. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. Can you bring those to 44? Because that wasn't on your list. Sure. Oh. So I have to do a little shameless plug before we close. Oh, we great. are having a community school summit. It's our second annual. Um, and we would love to maybe have you come and speak to I have to it on my room. calendar. I want to be there. So let's talk because sure. you can participate, but it would be great if maybe you could speak. So we'll or we have do, to. do some work with that. So we do have that. Thank you. That's from Daisy. Um, and you can register. It is free. It is from 9 to 3. Um, and you'll find more detail about the event. And the theme is engagement. And how are we engaging the community and families um, in our work. So um, they're going to start with the guest speaker is going to talk about community asset-based development. So how do you make those connections in a community with the strengths of the community and the needs of the school and the kids inside uh, the schoolhouse? So, um, I have a question. Yes. I have, I have yet to see anything written up about community schools in the uh, city newspaper. Oh, did I miss no, no. it? Maybe it was there and I didn't you see it. You did not miss that. I, I will follow up on that. Because That's a really Jack good Luso. point. Is the writer that does the one on the school? Yes, I can reach out to. I mean, I certainly will. will work with our communications department about that. Right, because yeah. the city, I mean, Gannett Press is useless, I think, regarding the school, except he wants. Except for the guy who wants to. But yeah, Tim does a really nice job of highlighting. They just mm -hmm. did something on um, expanded learning opportunities after-school programs, summer programs. They just did a lot of work on that. Well, and so. the new superintendent was right on the cover. Yes, and he was, yep. I mean, that was wonderful, I thought. Yeah. You couldn't say you didn't know what he looked like. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, I would love that because this is about system building too in our community. So free of charge, I will reach out to Absolutely. you. Absolutely, no, please okay. do. And you know, we'll make the connection with, with uh, Cecilia as well and get us on a so wonderful. Well, absolutely. So I'm going to wait to hear from John um, when in September we can prepare our bags for school uh, mm -hmm. 19. Okay. And uh, I'm already in conversation with Katarina on 17 and where we're going to drop those bags mm -hmm. off. But we're going to drop the bags off, but we're going to be there for a, we're going to call it a coffee meet and greet 
So we're going to have coffee and donuts and bagels to welcome the teachers <laughs> and help you. That's out okay. And passing out the bags with our goodies in it. Now, so is, is this just for is this just for teachers or no? It's for anyone. Um, and when you go on line, you can um, see the different sessions that are being offered. So it's for teachers, community members, parents. Um, Anyone that's interested in learning more about what community schools are, what people are doing in some of the schools, some of the work we're doing trying to move forward with community schools, um, how we do a needs assessment, what's the role of the principal, what's the role of the different agencies talking about that. So we'll have different panel members, time to have you know, answers and questions and answers, um, as well as presentations. Absolutely. And are the teachers exciting. coming to this? The teachers are coming. I can't tell you how many were. No, that's all right. You know, but I mean, they're 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 registering, especially the new community schools, because they're learning, right? Have you bring in the community, and you're very deliberate about it, about building the community school. The other, th the other thing we work on, we tried to work on, is this short-term busing and local busing. Because then the neighborhood and the community can be one and the same population. Mm -hmm. And yes. I think the thing that you have to learn, and maybe you know this already, Daisy, but when you work with any one school, it's all across the city. So they come from everywhere. Yes. Because, and you know, people say, well, how can you be a community school and it's not a neighborhood school? Neighborhood school is different, right? The community school is the structure, how we work it. Um, a neighborhood, you can be. A neighborhood school is you're pulling kids from your neighborhood, right? You're in a swath of area and all the kids flow into that mm -hmm. school. You can be a neighborhood school, mm -hmm. but not a community school, right? You can be a community school and not a neighborhood school. Why, why is that? Because not every school, m many of our schools, we're not a neighborhood school district anymore. It's parents choose a kindergarten. But that's what we're working for. Yeah. Our group is really strongly wanting neighborhood schools. Neighborhood schools. We don't want people running all over the city. We want them in our neighborhood. And yeah, and that, you know, that's that's the voice <coughs> of the community talking to the Board of Education and us, right, about, and that is board policy. So I would encourage, you know, if you feel strongly, that's where your board members are for. Now, and I don't need to tell this group that, but what's different about 17, right, is 17 um, advocated a variety of people advocated for them to be neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And there was a board policy to make them neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So our job was to say anybody that came in the, this area was to be d uh, channeled, channeled yeah. thank you for the bright <laughs> word, 217. Mm -hmm. They could opt out because the policy was that you could have a choice. But they could opt out. Families are not doing that. So in the K-1, 2, now into 3, what you're seeing is almost all those kids, particularly in the K this year, are from the neighborhood, mm -hmm. which is different than what we see in our other schools. But that was a specific board policy. So I drifted off, but that's neighborhood versus community. Um, but we'll talk about that here, too. Now, so. one of the things that we've also been talking about is trying to if we get local busing you know get yeah be it for 16 or 19 or even some of the citywide schools you'd yeah. like to have a lot of uh, kids from from the school there so you get more parents involved with the school because yeah. that's what 17 found is when they got from 22 to uh, 76 percent or whatever it is of mm -hmm. uh, local students in k through two suddenly parents in the school mushroomed and they got Absolutely. a lot more volunteers I mean, they've done a remarkable job <coughs> and on top of that they had a strong rec program and they had a lot of things coming together for them they had the settlement house <laughs> i do that they've had they have the settlement house they had the neighborhood association mm -hmm so that it was a true community effort to build mm -hmm. that. Um, so, and that's what we want in, in our neighborhood. Now, I will say some of the schools in, that you're working with are smaller. 
And so we might be thinking about, well, how does that look? If I live right by uh, Foundation, right, um, Foundation Academy, then maybe they have certain services that other community schools will access. Mm -hmm. Not everybody's, you can't put necessarily a health center at number 10 school. That's not going to make sense, right? The, either the, the property or the size of the school. So it's rethinking about what makes sense in an area, what makes sense in a school mm -hmm. community, in a neighborhood. So all of that combined, that's where it needs a city look as well. You yeah. can't just look at it just from a school. One of the things also that uh, Daisy and I had talked about was possibly making use of the outreach programs that um, the Neighborhood Service Center has to get teachers out into the community, especially if we were going, to, going to get uh, them out there recruiting to get more local students involved in the school. This would be particularly good for the community schools mm -hmm. where, um, you know, like Katerina, they went door to door to drum up more local involvement in the school mm -hmm. and um, having... They were provided with, I will say this, I mean these little things, right, that do they work, do they not work. When we did do the board resolution, we did put into their school a placement coordinator recruiter. So we said, this just can not happen by chance. You have to be deliberate about it, you have to plan for it. So they do have somebody in there saying, okay, I'm gonna go in the community, I'm gonna, and everything to break down any barrier around placement. So people didn't feel like that's another barrier to get to their school. Um, so. so let me say this, Beth. Um, you've given examples of the uh, placement coordinator, mm -hmm. the site coordinator, mm -hmm. expanded learning opportunities, and the director of community schools. But we never mentioned the word cost. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is a reality. And so when we, when we, if we say that this is the strategy mm -hmm. that we're going to use, then the district's got to be willing to say, we're going to reallocate Absolutely. some of our resources because we're not getting more. Like Beth said in the past, receivership schools came along with it came money, resources. This time so far, nothing. Right? So mm -hmm. I just want, uh, when do, why aren't you doing it? Or why aren't you moving more quickly and all that? Right. Because for these um, really powerful strategies, there is also a cost. And so we have to figure out what won't continue so that we can do this. Right. I think, too, I think with the city, um, and may, people read about that, that the board this year for the current schools, for this coming school year, did preserve the costs of our current community schools. Mm -hmm. um, but that was, to Cecilia's point, you know, you're making priorities about what you're going to fund. Um, so as we open up, try to get these uh, next group open, that we're finding the right resources to get it going. So that's why, you know, when agencies come to the table, we're looking for that collective impact. Yeah. You come with the resources sometimes. Sometimes um, many agencies, because they're trying, they're small, they don't have a huge budget either, are coming um, looking for, not looking for, but need a contract. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to find that mutual part for the funding. So come to the summit. Definitely, I want to put it on my towel. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. Really glad you we were able to join us. Our tardiness. Yes. We had a meeting before and then thought we were going to make it and then this light would not change. <laughs> <Why>? <laughs> and I said, I'm going to be able to you. you. Oh, okay. Very yeah. good. Okay. Good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, I would love it. I want to ask you to tell you. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you. I want to. And we live right here.
Thank you so much. Okay. Right. Salvation Army. Yes. I'm there for I'm there at the army for a personal reason. But I just directly went to them. I mean, I just went there and several. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. You have kids for the fact Thank you very much, Beth. Okay. Let me you come out. to our stuff. Okay. We have got to be here tonight. Okay. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> the